to the herd. Happy Monday. Jason Whitlock sitting in for Colin Cowherd. He's out on vacation all this week. Doug Gottlieb will be here the rest of the week. You have me today, and today we're talking big baller brand and why big baller brand is D-B-A. D-B-A, not D-O-A, D-B-A, dead before arrival. Lonzo Ball, the first to jump ship off of Big Baller brand. That, to me, is the story of the weekend. I'm going to tie it in. My theme for today is going to be about how Twitter and social media causes us, the media, to lie to you to lie to you. Everybody's dancing on the big baller, Lonzo Ball, LeVar Ball conversation because we don't want to deal with the social media backlash if we happen to tell you the truth about big baller brand and LeVar Ball. But sometimes actions speak louder than words. And when your dad has been flapping his gums for months, oh, big baller brand, we want a billion dollars from Nike or Adidas or any shoe company. Big baller brand's going to take over the world. And all it took was two games for Lonzo to say, oh, I'm going to wear Nike, I'm going to wear Adidas, I'm going to Mambas, uh, now throwback Air Jordans, Jordan 31s. Lonzo Ball has jumped ship on Big Baller Brand. Big Baller Brand is a t-shirt company. That's what Big Baller Brand is. One of my best friends in Kansas City, one of my best friends in life, he and his wife have a t-shirt company out of Kansas City. And it's quite successful. But it's a t-shirt company. It's a side hustle. They both have regular jobs, and they hustle T-shirts on the side. That's what LeVar Ball has created, a T-shirt company, not a shoe company, not anything that's worth a billion dollars, let alone $3 billion, like I heard him saying this weekend on Chris Broussard's radio show on Fox Sports Radio. But here is LeVar Ball talking to ESPN this weekend about Big Baller brand and his son's decision to wear other shoes. That boy can play barefoot and do the same thing. He just let him know he can play in any shoe he feels like it. And that's how that Big Baller brand roll. We got that independence. We don't have to be strapped down. You know how many players want to do that? Try another shoe on and can't? Sit their ass down and wear the one they told them to tie their foot to. Keep your foot in that shoe, on and off the court. Can't tell my boy nothing like that. He rolled what he want. That, in my view, was some projection by LeVar Ball. He can't tell his son anything about what shoe to wear. That's where this is headed. Lonzo Ball is starting to become independent and unbuckling himself from his loudmouth father. And I don't mean that sounds really, really negative. And I don't mean it in a really, really negative fashion. You raise a child, you raise anything to leave the nest and to be able to stand on their own two feet. And that's what we're starting to see from Lonzo Ball. His dad ex not executed, not, ran his mouth in a way to promote LeVar Ball. This has been more about promoting LeVar Ball than doing what's best for his son. And again, that sounds really, really negative. I don't mean it to be that negative. It's just truthful. And I will deal with the repercussions, the blowback over social media. I could care less. I listened to Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jones do a nice job calling the Summer League game, I think on Saturday or Friday, uh, for Lonzo Ball, but they were dancing. You could tell they were dancing. They were biting their tongue. At one point, Jeff Van Gundy said, uh, no one judges a kid by their parents. And I nearly fell off my couch. 
It's like, who doesn't judge a kid by their parents? Now, sometimes you raise a kid who's completely different than their parents, but you still judge a child by his parents. Again, to me, Lonzo Ball is different than his dad. Completely different. And LeVar's stick doesn't work for Lonzo. And Lonzo is backing away from that respectfully and politely, and that's why he's no longer wearing the shoes. The $500 overpriced shoes that are not selling, Lonzo Ball has backed away from, and now he's wearing whatever shoes he wants, and he's out. And his dad's talking about they're still looking for a shoe deal. You remember just a few weeks ago, everyone, oh, yeah, we got to, LeVar has started a business, and you got to respect the man for starting a business, and he's got big ambitions. And there were some of us out here saying, no, 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 let's pump the brakes. Let's pump the brakes. Is LeVar Ball in his lane is the question we should be asking, because I don't think he's Phil Knight. I don't think he's. Bill Duffy or Scott Boers or Tom, uh, Tom, why am I forgetting to, (laughs) Tom Condon. He's not a super agent. He's a guy who's been winging it as he goes. And if he would just back off, let his son do what he's been doing since he changed shoes and what he did quite well this weekend, his son can play this game. His son's not the next Magic Johnson. He may not even be the next Jason Kidd, but his son can play this game. And so as the more he steps away from the circus that his dad created, the better basketball player he appears to be. Yesterday against Dennis Smith Jr., the guy who has actually taken over the summer league and been the best player in the summer league, Lonzo Ball, before his calf tightened and he left the game, looked damn good yesterday. His shot, and every Laker shot was falling yesterday. Everybody on the team was knocking down shots. But Lonzo Ball more than held his own and gave Dennis Smith, uh, gave him the business for the 20-some-odd minutes that he was out there. Dennis Smith played well, too. But Lonzo Ball was knocking down shots, passing the ball. He looked like the guy, closer to the guy he's been hyped into being. That's as he marks his independence from his dad, steps away from the shoe deal. Big baller brand, DBA, dead before arrival. That thing, it's a T-shirt company. Congratulations, LeVar. You've created a T-shirt company. Good luck with it. All right, that's going to be my topic of conversation today, how social media manipulates us and takes the media in a very inaccurate, inauthentic direction. We're all... uh, Every word that comes out of our mouth, we're thinking about how is it going to land on social media, and it moves us away from being honest. Anybody with a brain could see that LeVar Ball and his antics weren't really about Lonzo, and they were about LeVar Ball and raising that brand. It wasn't about the kid. And again, sounds horribly negative, but I I couldn't imagine. I'm going to say this in LeVar Ball's defense. I couldn't imagine being a father. Being a man who sired, who uh, raised three sons who are this talented in a sport that matters in America, that would make me delusional. That would make me think I'm the greatest person since sliced bread. That would make me think that I had the answer to every question. Men, and particularly men that are in the sports, if you raise one son, let alone three, who are tremendous athletes, it will make you delusional. And hopefully what we've seen from LeVar Ball for the past year is his delusional state, and he will back it up and come back into reality. Let this son go out and blaze his own trail, carve his own path, Let him leave the nest and do whatever shoe deal he wants to do. That's where I hope this is going. 
That's why I hope we allow this to go. LeVar Ball, not a terrible person. Delusional? An attention whore? Yeah, there's a lot of people like that. He's being humbled by his son. He's being humbled by the market. No one cares about big ball of shoes. It's a flop. Is dead before arrival. All right, I'm joined today by Holly Saunders. And Holly, I got to say this. I don't normally sweat on the show. I'm nervous today for some reason. It might be you. <laughs> I didn't know we were allowed to say attention whore on the air. I had no oh. idea. That's where we're, Maybe we're right not. at the top here. <laughs> Maybe we're not. You know what You know what happened? The Floyd Mayweather, Conor McGregor oh, yeah. controversy, yeah. and if you've watched it on FS2, they were cussing and saying whatever the hell they wanted. And I was like, well, hell, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that pertains to us. But, yeah, let's talk some more about that. What would what, you think about that? Floyd and Conor? Yeah. Uh, I think it's been a great, great show. I think it's being, it's being dissed. And some people, friends of mine, Mike Wise, who works over at ESPN, friend of mine for a long time, J.A. Adande, good friend of mine, works over at ESPN. I've seen these guys criticizing it. And, and I'm like, and, and Mike Wise and Jay act like, I, I don't want to watch the fight. And this makes me less likely to watch the fight. And I'm like, come on, guys. Right. It's a fight. People say crazy things in a fight. What did you think of the suit with the, we'll call it the subliminal messaging that he was wearing? <sighs> Not the suit I would have worn, yeah. but Conor McGregor taking it to another level as Conor McGregor tends to he do. He did. He got my attention. He, he got me interested in it. I'll say right. that much. We're joined today by Holly Saunders. I'm Jason Whitlock filling in for Colin Cowher. I love Perky Jerky. What makes it so great are all the unique flavors. They have a new variety pack, Home Run. A lot of options. Listen, life gets boring fast. Try a different flavor. Every game, special offer, 40% off all multi-packs. The best tasting jerky on earth, guaranteed. All right, welcome back to The Herd. I'm Jason Whitlock. Still talking about LeVar Ball and Lonzo Ball. Imagine being a 19-year-old kid. You've entered the, into the NBA. All of You're the second-round pick in the NBA draft. All of your peers have signed... Uh, some sort of shoe contract, the, the rookies from last year, some of the rookies this year, they're cementing their shoe contract deals as they enter the league. You don't have one because your dad has decided he's going to be a disruptor and disrupt Nike, Adidas, uh, Under Armour, Reebok, companies that have uh, been at this for 50, 60, I don't know how many years, your dad's decided he's going to disrupt them and he's going to start Big Baller brand. You're going to take on the world. Your dad's qualifications for this are he's a personal trainer and he played college basketball at Washington State for a year and he trains you in your backyard. He's orchestrating the disruption of some of the most powerful companies in America. You got to be sitting there. This is crazy. This is crazy. No matter how well intentioned, this is crazy. And those of us in the media have sat here and basically co-signed for this and acted like it's not crazy what LeVar Ball is attempting to do. We've acted like, oh, this is all working out and the hype is good when we can see that Lonzo Ball is a shy kid who really just wants to play basketball and not be involved in any controversy. The reason why we in the media have lied and co-signed for this, again, goes back to social media. If you just happen to criticize LeVar Ball, Prepare yourself for a swarm of tweets of people calling you racist, calling you a hater, calling you all sorts of names because you're sitting there saying, hey, this isn't best for the kid. This doesn't really fit the kid's personality. We're, we're acting like we've never seen helicopter parents before. We've acting like we've never seen Todd Marinovich's dad. We're acting like we've never seen... Joan Bonet and her parents, and I know that's a, a really extreme case, but sometimes helicopter parents get completely out of control. And not everybody uh, is Richard Williams, who, again, 
had some success with his daughters and deserves a lot of credit for that. But that doesn't mean everything Richard Williams did or everything LeVar Ball does or everything my parents did doesn't mean it was the right thing to do. I had great parents, really great parents. Me and my brother, both college educated, never been in a minute's trouble. Uh, my, de- my brother, very responsible father, husband, the whole nine yards. My parents weren't perfect. My mother's watching now, and she's about to call me or text me mad as hell because I'm going to tell a story. I've seen cocaine once in my life, and I've lived a pretty crazy life. I've seen cocaine once in my life, and it was when my mother went on a vacation bowling trip with her girl. My parents divorced. My mother, uh, you know, raised us as a single mom. My mother went on a bowling trip to Florida with her girlfriends, and she left my cousin Kevin in charge of us. Look, Kevin was my idol as a kid, but he was a thug. And all of his buddies came. (laughs) He was babysitting us for a week. All of his buddies came over, and they had cocaine spread across our dining room table. I was probably 11 years old. Not the greatest decision by my mother. Still the greatest mother in the history of the planet in the world. So what I'm saying is parenting is complicated. It's filled with good things and bad things. And if someone happens to point out, hey, LeVar, I don't know if this is the best thing. You've done a lot of great things. But I don't know if starting a shoe company and creating all this controversy around your son, I don't know if that's the best thing in the world. That's not harsh criticism of LeVar Ball. That's not some example of racism or or selling out because you've criticized LeVar Ball. It's the truth. And we're not allowed to say the truth in the media anymore because of social media. Anybody that goes anywhere near an uncomfortable truth gets vilified in social media. And too much of the media is afraid. And I I don't blame them because their bosses live in fear of social media. And so we've moved into this very inauthentic phony world where no one says what they really think. And that's how Jeff Van Gundy, who did a great job calling that game and making some points, very subtle points about Lonzo Ball. Look, hey, maybe we've overhyped him a little bit. Not sure if we should compare him to Jason Kidd, Hall of Famer. Let's, let's let the kid bake in the oven before we go there. But then he also was dancing around uh, say, oh, yeah, no one judges a kid by his parents. The hell they don't. That's not reality. People do it every day of the week. And then we spent all this time talking about LeVar Ball. What about Dennis Smith Sr.? This guy raised two kids by himself because their mother abandoned them. But we can't talk about him. Only we can talk about LeVar Ball, and he's the greatest dad, and if you criticize anything he's done, you you know, you're the worst human being on the planet. We need to move beyond our fear of social media so that we can get back to telling the truth. Because, again, if you're somewhat religious or if you just believe in common sense, the truth actually sets people free. The truth actually moves people in a positive direction. I'll give you one more example, again, how success fools us into thinking everything we do is right. I've been a pretty successful sports writer, broadcaster, whatever, media personality. The equivalent of of what I'm talking about, LeVar Ball and what he's doing, it's like I overeat. People can point that out, hey, Whitlock, you overeat. I could sit there and say, well, what do you mean I'm successful? Overeating's part of my success. No, it's not. It's something I do that's wrong, and I would be more successful if I didn't. And (laughs) no different than what people have been trying to point out about the balls. There's some good things here, but there's some things that need to be removed. And LeVar Ball being front and center on this kid's basketball life needs to be removed. This is the Herd Podcast. All right, listen, I I am really, really excited about this next guest. 
Michael Vick, the former NFL star, uh, is about to join us. I don't know if Mike was listening earlier in the show, but I told a story about my cousin Kevin. Hope he's not watching right now, but he don't care. I'm just telling the truth. I told a story about my cousin Kevin. I'm not going to go all off into my family history, and but, but the I was not a Michael Vick fan in Atlanta. I was a Michael Vick fan post incarceration. I was a Michael Vick fan once he got in trouble, and it's because of my family history. I was talking about my cousin Kevin. I idolized him as a kid. Uh, he solved a lot of problems for me uh, when I was a kid. I'll never forget, I was probably in fourth or fifth grade, and I was a big kid, but a kid that was 17, 18 years old bullying me, and my cousin had just got home from the joint. Little dude, but man, he was prison swall. And he came over and told this dude, you keep messing with my cousin, I'm going to come back over here and kick your butt. Love this dude. Again, my mother made the mistake of having him babysit me and my brother uh, for a week while she's on a bowling trip. And it's the only time I saw cocaine in my life. It was spread out all over our dining room table. All of his friends were there. For, I, can, I was probably 11 years old. The dude had me smoking weed in the car with him and his friends at 11 years old. My mother's the greatest person in the world. I know she's mad at me right now for telling this story. But anyway, because of my full understanding of how hard it is to transition back into the mainstream society after incarceration, I became the huge Michael Vick fan. I remember Michael has no reason to remember this, but I, his first game in Philadelphia, I went, covered it, interviewed him afterwards, rooting for him. I thought Michael, the way he handled everything after incarceration, a blueprint, a role model, an example, an important thing for black men because of America's mass incarceration. But anyway, Michael Vick is here. Michael Vick, welcome to The Herd. Come sit on the couch. I, I One of my favorite people, let alone football players of all time, just because of the way you've handled things after a big mistake. Uh, who were you in Atlanta, and when you look back, dealing with the fame, the money, the adulation, do you look back and say, oh, man, I, I was headed for trouble? And maybe getting in trouble is not the best thing that could happen to a person, but some people, that's the only thing that stops them and sends them another direction. Yeah, for me, um, you know, I was, I was almost in a place where I was always trying to find myself um, in terms of leadership, uh, like I said earlier, um, in, in terms of being um, a philanthropist, wanting to, you know, give back. So many things I wanted to do but didn't know how to approach it. Uh, Arthur Blank always told me, um, lean on me in regards to uh, things that you want to get done, things that you want to happen, goals, aspirations uh, outside of football. Uh, and I just didn't know how to approach it. And it took a long time. It took for me to be incarcerated, to set a new uh, criteria of goals, um, aside from football. You know, the football was easy. You know, you want to score touchdowns. You want to play in Pro Bowls. Uh, it was all about helping kids and, and setting a new tone and, and different dynamic. I, I, this, sound, this is a very stupid question. I feel stupid asking, but I got to ask. Was incarceration a good thing for Michael Vick? I would say incarceration was good for me because, and I wouldn't say it's good for everybody. Yes. You know, I, I was living with a lot of demons. I wasn't necessarily uh, taking on that leadership role, uh, the role model uh, role, so to speak, that, you know, our organization expected me to be. Uh, on the field, yes, I was doing it, uh, leading by example, but not off the field, which I think is just as important. You go to Philadelphia, Andy Reid, uh, Jeff Lurie, the owner, they wrapped their arms around you. What was that like? What was the – when you came out of prison, what was the entire experience? Just Tony Dungy, I think, was the first to wrap his arms around you and help you get back into the league. What was that like? It was, it was tough. You know, you, you enter in a situation where it's just the unknown. 
Uh, perceptions are different. Uh, the world is 90% perception, 10% reality. So uh, I had to change that in a sense. Good thing I had great people around me who was pulling for me, who wanted me to do well. Uh, understood the impact that I could have outside of the game of football, which we all thought was important. I knew it was important. Uh, and, and just being a role model, doing something different, not being known for just the guy on the field. And that was one of the goals I set when I was away. How important was Tony Dungy in getting you back into the league? If he hadn't stepped in, do you think you would have gotten back in? Coach Dungy uh, played a major role in uh, me being able to come back and, and play in the National Football League. Uh, he came, came and seen me about four months prior to my release, and we just uh, sat down for maybe two hours and talked about everything that I wanted to do moving forward, coming out, uh, you know, what type of impact I wanted to have, uh, you know, on a lot of kids and uh, just the masses of people. And I thought that was just extremely important uh, to him. I thought it was important to uh, the the community of, of Philadelphia and, you know, especially to my teammates, you know, showing them that I could be a role model. I was a changed man leading by example. You were a tremendous leader. You played very well in Philadelphia. Uh, one season, I remember 21 and six, eight and three record. But more than anything, more y your leadership actually overshadowed your on-field performance in Philadelphia. And I know you took some flack for it. And I, I, the Undisputed asked you this question. I want to ask again. You, you kind of stood up for Riley Cooper uh, in a situation where, for those of you that don't remember, Riley Cooper, white wide receiver for the Eagles, drunk at a country music concert, yeah, threatens where they was at. They yeah. Were, yeah. <laughs> threatens uh, to fight Foreign someone, territory. calls him the the N word. You defended Riley Cooper or defended him staying on the team. Why? Well, I honestly thought that listen, this is not Riley as a person. I, I know him. I've been around him for the last five, six years. Multiple conversations, spent time with him in training camp. Uh, he knows my family. I know him. I just didn't see that side of him. Um, but I, I guess you, you know, when tempers flare, people get upset. You know, anything is bound to be said or happen. So that part didn't strike me, you know, didn't catch me off guard. Um, you know, what really took me aback was the way my teammates reacted. And I wanted to smooth everything over because I how, knew. How did they react? Oh, they was upset. You know, every single one of them. And not just the black guys in, in the locker room. You know, the white guys in the locker room as well were very upset, you know, at Riley. And listen, he almost just turned into the black sheep instantly. Like nobody wanted to talk to him being in the lunchroom. He's sitting by himself. And I just took a different approach, took a different stand, you know, for everybody overall. And, and I knew we had to, you know, continue to stay, you know, focused on the mission at hand and not let that small distraction, um, you know, be the downfall of our, our season. Mike, you said something very real that I hope didn't fly over people's head, it is that in an argument, tempers flare. And people say a lot of things. And it, it, people can make a mistake, and that doesn't define them totally. Right. That just defines them in yeah. that moment doing something stupid. And that's where, that's where I was on Riley Cooper. I've thought about the dumb things I've said yeah. in a fight or in an argument. You know, well, that's the question I posed to all my teammates. Like, look, let's, let's be real. We've all said things in the spirit of the moment that we wish we could take back that we really didn't mean. And you know, our emotions got the best of us. Let's just be honest. And I was just trying to bring a realistic situation uh, to a head in terms of, you know, having guys think about, you know, things that they've or situations that they've been in where, you know, they reacted you know, just totally out of, uh, you know, impulse. And I wanted everybody to just relive those moments, understand, listen, we all got skeletons in our closet. We all do certain things. We all say things that we want to take back. But uh, I was proud of those guys because, you know, after two days, you know, it was a normal locker room again. So we never talked about it. 
it was never an issue again. Uh, I knew some guys didn't let it go, but hey, at least we was able to get past it. We're joined by Michael Vick. My Michael, I, I want to stay in this for a little bit longer. This a little bit uncomfortable, but I, I got to keep it real. Keep it 100. I, I, I'm, I'm from, again, I know all sorts of people. Yeah, I, I, I know, I know guys that are still involved with dogfighting. I, I know, and again, it's not that I condone it, but I know the culture where people can come from, where they think that's okay, and they yeah. have to learn and be taught different. And, and so when I hear you talk about Riley Cooper, I think back to when the thing happened with you, I was like, don't condone it, don't agree with it, but I know how this can happen. I know how you can be a part. And I used to live in the South. Yeah. And and it's go, that's not an excuse for Michael Vick. It's but, not an excuse for anybody. Yeah, but it doesn't define who Michael Vick is. Yeah. It's more reflection. Uh, and I don't want to sound like I'm making excuses because I'm really not. But if people, so many people in the media, and I don't want to get you crossways with the media, but so many people in the media just don't know. They don't yeah. know where people come from. Right. And, and it's and, not for everybody to know. Listen, I mean, people come from all different backgrounds and the baggage you bring with them, that's totally, uh, they, they bring with them is totally up to them. You know, it's it's almost your responsibility to navigate, you know, as you grow older, uh, to see life in a different perspective. You don't always have people um, who can help you in that regard, but I think we see enough. You know, I think when you dream and you know, you aspire to be an actor or a professional football player or an NBA uh, player. You have to take a different approach. Your, your steps and your path has to be different. And for me, you know, I became a product of my environment. You know, not intentionally. I didn't yep. want to be that way. Um, I just got older and I felt like I should have known better and I should have did better. You know, even being 26, 27, you know, the tough part about my situation, I had everything in the world and I still, you know, condoned in it. Everything in the world, but, and I don't know this, I'm asking the question. But not priority, you know, but, 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 that's but tough. I don't know the answer to this question. I think I know, but I don't know. Did you have a father growing up? Yeah, I did, but we wasn't, um, you know, my high school coach was more so like my father mentor. You know, my dad was more so a provider. Um, not necessarily the leader that I expected him to be or wanted him to be, uh, but I didn't fault him for that because he became a product of the environment as well. All right, we're joined by Michael Vick. I'm going to keep you for another segment. We're going to get into Colin Kaepernick, Cam Newton, hear Mike Vick's all-time top five dual-threat quarterbacks. I'm Jason Whitlock. You're in the hood. Catch the herd from noon to 3 Eastern on iHeartRadio and FS1. All right, welcome back to The Herd, the H-E-R-D, not the H-O-O-D. I'm Jason Whitlock filling in for Colin Cowherd. Holly wow. Saunders here filling in for Christine Leahy. And Michael Vick is here keeping it 100 with us. Uh, Michael Vick, the former NFL star, since it's at the top of the news, Ezekiel Elliott for the Dallas Cowboys in a bit of trouble. There have been rumors that he's going to – He's going to face suspension, and now there's a story that he knocked out or beat up a DJ at a bar. H how concerned should the Cowboys be about Zeke? I mean, obviously, it should be some concern because Zeke's a young superstar in this league, and at some point, he's going to have to act appropriately. Uh, we don't want to see a young talent like him uh, – Spend a ton of time on the sidelines for, you know, self-inflicted reasons, you know, unnecessary reasons. Um, he has the, you know, a lot of potential to be the best running back to ever play the game. I, I know that's saying a lot because there's so many guys that can't, that's can't come before him. But when you look at the type of talent and the team that he's on and everything um, surrounding the Dallas Cowboys and now going into the future, he has to grow up fast. He has to be, become a leader early. I look at some of these young people, and just like I looked at yourself when you entered the league, it, the money and the fame sounds like the greatest thing in the world, 
but it can also be a just a huge burden for a young person. There's no way to prepare for that. It's it's, it's a gift and a curse in a sense. I mean, you 21 years old with millions of dollars, and it's hard for people to tell you what to do. Uh, even the guys that they may consider their role models really can't get through to them uh, directly. And these guys got to understand that, you know, they're, they're the future of the National Football League, but the people in the high power are not going to continue to tolerate the things that happen off the field. And it's, it's such a distraction. Um, it has to be contained. You know, it has to be contained. I know Roger's trying to do everything that he can. Um, but you don't want to see these guys suspended. The fans pay their money to see these these kids play. And and that's what it's all about. So we, they, I say we because, you yep. know, former player, but they have to understand that, look, it's not about me. You know, it's a collective effort. You know, you represent, you know, organization, and you have to represent them well. You don't, you watch the TV show Game of Thrones for any reason? No, but I, I've heard about it. I, I think I'm going to get into it. Uh, so I like to use the analogy. Early on, they had a King Robert Baratheon. And uh, he basically died from excess. His life was so good. Bring me these women. Bring me this food. Bring me this wine. And That'll kill you. Yes. And so <laughs> I look at, again, I look at young people that become famous and become wealthy and they become little kings. And uh, it, it's it's the hardest thing on your ego and on your mind. You almost think of yourself, and I'm just saying it figuratively, you think of yourself as a god yeah. because you, can, you have the power with that fame and wealth to make a lot of people happy. Oh, mom, you want a new house? Got you. Oh, uh, auntie, you, you need... So a new car, uh, you got a nephew, a niece, a cousin, and he's a college tuition paid. Yeah. You become that provider for everybody, and that does something to your ego. It makes you think you're more than what you are, just an individual person. And you have the world at the palm of your hands, and you can go anywhere you want to go, buy anything you want to buy, and you know that just happens you know, overnight for some kids. And, yeah, we work hard for it. You know, the fame and the splendor is excellent. You know, that's the reward. But it's still a ton of work that has to be done in between. So you can't just, you know, enjoy your off season. Your off season has to be predicated to, you know, tons of hard work, whether it's, you know, you working out, you know, four to five days a week, you know, working out with your teammates, um, you know, doing a little, a little off the field work, you know, breaking it up. Um, maybe spending some time with kids or football camps. You got to find ways to be productive in uh, different settings. And I don't think it's enough of that out there right now. Um, a lot of these guys have to be mentored and they really have to look up to the guys that came before them in terms of what they're doing. And you still have guys who are doing a remarkable job. I look at Russell Wilson and the things that he's been able to do, um, you know, in terms of on and off the field. You know, he's a total champion, you know, all the way through. We're joined by Michael Vick. Mike, during the break, you mentioned some, the game was too easy for you. Yeah, it was at times. And, and I, I said I grew up with Jeff George, super talented. <laughs> yeah. Football, Strong baseball. Yeah. Pure, Smart guy. It, too easy, but it was too easy for him. Right. Some, and that's where I think like a guy like Tom Brady, talented but not so overly talented. Sometimes you can have too many gifts, and that's what I thought – perhaps was a problem for you is you, you had too many gifts. Yeah. Well, with, with me, it was, you know, the speed was remarkable. Uh, arm strength, never had a problem with it. Uh, could pick up plays and the understanding of the game was always there for me. Uh, so the game came fairly easy. So it was times where I didn't really know what to work on. It wasn't until I got with Andy Reid where it was multiple formations. It was different concepts, uh, different ways to get the ball into uh, the hands of the receivers and the running backs and beating the opposition, you know, mentally. So it was a different challenge. So I went, when I went to Philly, it was, you know, a different form of game planning and uh, preparation and study. When I was young, it was just go out and just run through the defense, you know, run through anybody that, that steps in front of you uh, or 
find a way to make a miss. Uh, it wasn't pass protections. It wasn't picking up the blitz. It was early when I had Dan Reeves. And then we kind of sort of got into the wildcat and, you know, different forms of offenses started to evolve and take over. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it was it was all fun. You know, I wish I can go back to that day and time and really do it different. But towards the end, you know, the latter stages of my career made me appreciate, you know, the things I didn't do in the beginning because I was able to do it at the end. Cam Newton, a six foot five, 260 pound version of Michael Vick. Do you ever look at Cam Newton and say, damn, he's got the same thing going on, not off the field, but the same thing going on on the field as, as I did? Yeah, I, I look at Cam sometime and be like, Man, I wish I had his size. <laughs> Things I would be able to do. <laughs> I was 6'5", 255, and ran a 4'340". That's the key. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, Cam is, is is going through a lot. Um, you know, he had the injury this past offseason. I, I think he had the surgery. Um, a lot of pressure and expectations are going to come down on you going into your fifth, sixth, seventh year. You know, those are times of... Those are the times when contracts starting to get starting to get extended, um, renegotiations. Uh, you know the team is being built to built around you, so you really have to, you know, take advantage of those those opportunities. Those years are the most important uh, in terms of the injuries and um, protecting yourself and the scrutiny. You know, there's not anything any other quarterback hasn't gone through. Um, Cam just has to fight this battle, and nobody else can do it for him. It, it has to be done by him. So I'm excited to see how he's going to react. This is going to be a great season for a lot of quarterbacks. And, you know, in 2015, Cam played in the Super Bowl. Last year, they didn't make it. So now it's more pressure, more expectation. Uh, but he has to accept it, you know, with a grain of salt and continue to push through. We're joined by Michael Vick. Colin Kaepernick for a different set of reasons, is having a hard time getting back into the NFL. Yeah. Uh, he's got some controversy surrounding him that, you know, has to do with his protest. Do you – what do you think about the way the NFL is treating Colin Kaepernick? Some people are saying he's being blackballed. I happen to think that it's about teams wanting their yeah, quarterback to be all nothing, in. It has – Nothing to do with him being blackballed. Uh, the gesture that he made, you know, last year when he took the stand to do what he did, it, it, listen, we all appreciated it. We respected it. Um, and, and, and it was a good thing. It was a good thing. I really think, you know, the stand that he took has nothing to do with him not having a job or playing in the National Football League right now. And being frank, Colin didn't have the la the best two years, you know, last his last two seasons. I mean, it, it wasn't as productive as what we've seen him do. And maybe it's due to coaching changes and, uh, you know, musical chairs in the, in the, in the positions around him and the players. Uh, but I think in terms of him being back, getting back out on the field, it's going to have to be a team that can suit to his skill set and what he does, you know, what he does well. Um, Mobility inside and outside of the pocket, um, you know, making plays with his feet, maybe a little bit of the wildcat, whatever they want to call it, mixed in. But it it has to be some type of scheme that helps, you know, Kaepernick and um, that team in terms of productivity. You know, any other type of offense, I don't think uh, will help him right now because it's going to take so long to, you know, adjust and learn the system, protections, blitzes. Um, what to look for, receivers, you know, that type of, uh, you know, that just that type of camaraderie don't happen overnight. What do you think of teams or people in the media like me that say because of his activism and because of what he seems to be into over social media, he's not really all in on football. Football is not that important to him. And teams from that position want guys who are obsessed with football. Yeah, well, we don't know his commitment, his dedication to the game right now. Uh, unless you talk to Colin personally, you probably won't know. I still think his heart is in football. Uh, he's fairly young, you know, st still in his fifth, sixth season. He has 
a ton of football ahead of them. Uh, but, you know, it, it's all predicated on what, you know, what teams want in the, in the quarterback position. Now, I'm surprised that he's not a backup, you know, with anybody right now. But as you look at all the teams around the National Football League, uh, a lot of teams have good, solid backups that's been there for three or four years and understand the system. So when Colin come in, it, it's starting from ground zero. And, you know, in terms of his social media and what he likes to do and what he likes to be involved in, you know, it's all at his discretion. It's what he wants to do. I'm pretty sure he's uh, understanding that the things that he does put on social media, he, you know, he gets involved in, is going to be heavily scrutinized because you're a quarterback in the National Football League. Now, a lot of teams doesn't like it, don't like it. They don't want guys active on Twitter and Instagram. And, you know, I wouldn't want it either if I was a – you know, an owner of a team or worked in the PR department. You got to contain certain things, and so, some things need to be kept private. So, you know, I'm rooting for Colin. You know, I'm his biggest supporter. The guy wears my number, so I'm always supporting him and be there for him. Who are Michael Vick's top five all-time dual-threat quarterbacks? Number one, myself. <laughs> you know, I don't think it get any better than that, and I'm just being frank. Is there any bias in that opinion? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, listen. You got yourself ahead of Steve Young. Yeah, I mean, Steve was one of the greatest. And Steve got a ring, but, I mean, I look back at the, you know, the top ten uh, most mobile quarterbacks, the show that they have on NFL Network, and they got me ranked, like, number seven. I'm like, wow, what is, you know, what's that about? And I know some good guys that came before me, but, <laughs> you know, as far as quickness, ability, um, you know, the the opportunities that I, I and uh, situations that I had where I created you know plays that you'll never see again, you know I think that put me at the top. But yeah, you know Steve Young number two, Randall Cunningham, uh, Aaron Rodgers, you know definitely one of the. Top. You got Doug Flutie number four. And That's Flutie. the one that shocked me. Yeah, well Doug Doug's in number five. You know, Doug was he? I mean he kept it squeaky clean. You know he, was, he maneuvered the pocket. Uh, Mobile, you know, didn't get sacked a lot. You know, played real consistently for the Chargers a couple of years. I can't remember too many others. So he played in Buffalo, had some good years there. And I mean, you got to think, man, the guy was only 5'8, 5'9. <laughs> and very impressive. Very impressive. All right. Well, that was Michael Vick. Michael, thank you so much. Thanks for having uh, me. Great interview. Great stuff.